my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel, Lord, to give up.
Good morning and welcome to St. Giles Presbyterian Church here in Prince George, British Columbia. My name is the Reverend Alan Yee and I am the minister in association here at St. Giles. First off, I wanted to wish everyone a happy Easter. We are so glad that you can join us wherever you are today. This Easter Sunday is our second Easter where we have to celebrate while being physically apart. But know that wherever you are, we do miss you, and we pray that this Easter will be the final Easter where we have to be apart. If this is the first time that you are joining our service, we welcome you. If you are in the Prince George uh, a, a community in the area, uh, when we finally meet again, when the church is finally open again, we invite you to join us and to meet our community. If you are joining us uh, from another part of the world, we look forward to meeting you one day. As we begin our Easter Sunday service, um, I just wanted to go through just one housekeeping announcement for the St. Giles Presbyterian Church. Uh, and that is as uh, the, the season of Lent ends and as, as we celebrate Easter today, uh, there's Eastertide, which is the 50 days from now until Pentecost. Uh, and Joanna has prepared uh, a take-home package for you and so if you are interested in one of those packages, please do let us know. You can either email us, uh, email Joanna at, at the church, or give us a phone call at the office. As we begin our Easter Sunday service, our call to worship comes from Psalm 118. And it says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say, his love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his love endures forever. Amen. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we, we come to you this morning, this Easter Sunday morning, with hearts full as we remember your great love that endures forever. This is, the, this is the day where we come together, where we gather and remember the empty tomb. And in the empty tomb, we are reminded of your great and awesome power, that it is through you, through God, the author of life, that you conquered death. The empty tomb is so powerful, and because of that, we give you praise. Our Heavenly Father, as we come together as a community of faith, we ask, Lord, that you would gather our hearts together, that you would weave us together, weave our souls together, that even though we cannot meet physically in person, that we continue to be reminded that we are part of the body of Christ, that Jesus, you are its head. It is because of your great life, uh, your great love and sacrifice on the cross that we come, to come together as one. Our Heavenly Father, we pray as we turn our attention to our world. And we know that it is broken. Every time we read the news or turn on our televisions, we see how human beings hate one another. We think of the cases that are before the courts because of the death of Mr. George Floyd. We think of the hatred that's been perpetrated on the Asian community, both in the United States and in Canada because there are fears, because people blame the Asian community for the coronavirus. We hear about genocide. We hear about wars in countries all over the world. We hear about death and violence between religious groups. And we can see at the heart of the problem that it is all about us, our hearts, our people groups, our own rights, our own interests that when we only look at ourselves and only want the best for ourselves, we have no room for others. And so for this, we ask for healing. And more importantly, Lord God, we ask for forgiveness. Our Heavenly Father, we are an imperfect people. We are people who are not innocent. We are people who often think to ourselves that that's somebody else, that's not me. Yet, when your Holy Spirit begins to shine a light on our lives, we know, Lord, that we are not blameless. And it is only through Jesus Christ, who shed blood washes away our sins, that we come before you. 
And so, Heavenly Father, that we ask that you would search us, that you would know our souls, that you would convict us of our sins, that you would forgive us of our transgressions. And it is because of what you have done on this cross through your sacrifice. It is only because of this that we can do the same for others. It is only through this that we can forgive others as well. And so, Heavenly Father, forgive us for what we have done in order that we may forgive others. Our Heavenly Father, we pray for our own community of St. Giles, and we lift up those who are hurting, who are sick, who have lost loved ones. We know, Lord, that during this time of COVID, many of us are not able to visit with the ones that we love most. We know that being separated from our friends and families is already hard enough. However, being separated during this time and being, being told that we are not able to be with them for fear of spreading the virus is almost too much for us to take. And so we pray, Father, that you would give us strength, that you would give us hope during these times. We think of Andres and the loss of his grandma, who is in Ontario. We think of Dr. Chong's family, who cannot be with him as he recovers from his stroke. We continue to pray for Harry and Brian, who are receiving cancer treatment. And we pray for all those in our community who are sick. We also lift up anyone who is living alone or apart from their families, that you would be with them and comfort them. And we thank you, Lord God, for our pastoral care ministry here at St. Giles, for those who are on the team, for those who reach out, to those who are alone. We ask, Lord God, that their spirits would be lifted up. Our Heavenly Father, we come now, Lord, before your throne, and as we worship together, may your Holy Spirit be among us, that you would open our hearts, our ears, our eyes, and may Jesus be among us. May we see your face, we pray. And now, Lord, we pray together the Lord's Prayer, the one that we hold so dear to our hearts because it reminds us of you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As we begin our service this morning, will you join me in reading the Easter Sunday liturgy? I'll be reading the leader portion of that liturgy, and I would ask that you join Joanna as she reads and leads, uh, and, and you at home if you would read the bolded words. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. He was dead, and now he lives. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. The tomb is empty. He was dead, and now he lives. The journey begins again. Come, let us follow him. And let us start the new journey with prayer. God, God of, of life, life you, you came to us and you redeem all, all things. things. And now, now we, we give, give ourselves, ourselves to you and continue your work of good news and reconciliation in the world. world. Give us give the us strength to follow you on the mission you that you have called us to. In the name, the name of, of Jesus, Jesus we, we pray. pray. Amen. Amen.
Our scripture reading this morning comes from Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 to 15. And it says this, After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord, descending from heaven, came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has been raised. And he said, Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he has been raised from the dead. And indeed, he is going ahead of you to Galilee, and there you will see him. This is my message for you. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came to him, took hold of his feet, and they worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. While they were going, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priest everything that had happened. And after the priests had assembled with the elders, they devised a plan to give a large sum of money to the soldiers, telling them, You must say, His disciples came by night and stole him away while you were sleeping. If this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And the story is still told among the Jews to this day. Friends, this is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Over the last six weeks, we've been in the season of Lent. And in the Lenten season, we've been preparing for this very day, Easter Sunday. The Lenten season is important to the church because it's a time where we, as the community of faith, we come together, we prepare, we remember what Jesus has done 
on the cross. If you joined us on Good Friday for our service, um, you would have known that we had read through the Passion of the Christ, that story in Matthew where it shows, where it painstakingly shows Jesus' final days before he was led to the cross. Yes, the Easter Sunday story, when we read it from the Gospel of Matthew, seems short, it seems compressed, because it only spans through Matthew chapter 28. Yet, this was done on purpose. Matthew chapter 28 is the, is the peak of the crescendo. If the passion of the Christ in Matthew chapter 26 and Matthew chapter 27 if that shows us Matthew building up to something great, then Matthew chapter 28 reveals to us, as well as the original readers, that this is the point of the Gospel of Matthew. And the main point, the, the main theme of Matthew is in order for him to unpack for the readers and really show that Jesus is the King of Israel. Remember how Matthew chapter 1 begins. Matthew chapter 1 began as he lays out the genealogy of Jesus' family. Matthew chapter 1 shows us Jesus' family line and how it all began. It stretches from Abraham all the way to King David, and it finally ends with Mary and Joseph and the Christmas story. And so for Matthew chapter 28, we see that Jesus is indeed the King of Israel. He is the promised Messiah. He is the one that was foretold in the Old Testament. And the Gospel of Matthew shows us Jesus' life and ministry. Everything is centered on him as he begins, as he proclaims the word, the kingdom of heaven is near. So the kingdom of heaven is near, but in Matthew chapters 26 and 27, we are told that Jesus is crucified. If the gospel of Matthew had ended at chapter 27, we would have seen that Jesus was just an ordinary man who lived during Roman times, who lived a good life and led a revolution, but ultimately he died. If the Gospel of Matthew had ended at chapter 27, then Jesus would have just been an ordinary guy living at a certain point in history. And most likely, after everything was said and done, most likely he would have been forgotten. Yet, Good Friday, Good Friday is the time of the year where the church celebrates and remembers Jesus' life and death. And for 2,000 years, Jesus had not been forgotten. Why? Because of the Easter story, because of this crucial final chapter in Matthew chapter 28. Because this tells us of Jesus' resurrection. Easter Sunday. Easter Sunday is the day that everything changed. And so as we dig into our scriptures this morning from Matthew 28, will you, will you join me in prayer? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you and we give you thanks for Easter Sunday. This is the day that we come together where we remember what you have done for us. And so we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would be among us, that you would open the scriptures to us, that you would open the eyes of our heart, Lord, that you would open our ears and reveal to us your word. For this we ask in your name. Amen. Change is difficult. And we know this, right, on a personal level as well as a collective level. So, for example, when change occurs in our lives, we have this period of adjustment and transition. Moving into a new city or a new home is one of those major changes in our lives. And so maybe you've moved to a city like Prince George. Maybe you've come here for work and for school. And this is a major change because you know that life from now on will be different. 
You've got to get used to your new surroundings. You've got to figure out where the grocery store is. You've got to You've got to find a family doctor if you're able to. And in my case, when we moved to Prince George, I had to find a good and reliable and honest mechanic. Change is difficult. Collectively, we know that change is is difficult as well as a whole. And by society, I don't mean Prince George, but I mean globally as well. Collectively, in the last 13 months, we have learned how to change. With COVID-19, nothing is the same. When we go out now, even to the grocery store, even to maybe to the convenience store, we're told that we have to wear face masks. We have learned to social distance. We have, we have learned to wash our hands every time we step out of the house. We've learned to use hand sanitizers multiple times a day. And it would seem that life for us, everything has changed. Even in the past six months, our younger daughter, she's in daycare. And as she's been there, there was a new teacher uh, that began helping out with her class. Um, And finally, just a a couple of weeks ago, her, her photo was posted on the wall. And I was looking at the photo and I said to myself, oh, that's what she looks like. Because of the face mask protocols, I've only ever seen her eyes. It's safe to say that everything has changed. And because of this change, we've learned to use new phrases like, this is our new reality, or we're living in unprecedented times. These phrases have been thrown out and used constantly. And as I talk to you, as I talk to many of you in the congregation, I I get this sense, this yearning about um, going back to the days how things were. Even when I think about this Easter, today it reminds me of this yearning to go back. A few weeks ago, Dr. Bonnie Henry, uh, as she was in, uh, making, uh, making her announcements at the presser, she mentioned that she would be working with religious leaders to possibly open up uh, for in-person worship services. And as these uh, announcements were being made, there were comments of, yes, we can finally uh, come back and worship. Maybe we'd be open for Easter. Last week, we were told about the variances and exceptions, and we were told that we could have indoor worship services. And then just this past Monday, we were told that as numbers and cases were rising, that the variances that had been allowed were now clawed back, and that we wouldn't be meeting indoors, and we wouldn't be having in-person worship services. And so we know that everything has changed. Living in this new reality has been one of these phrases where we, we, we used it over and over again. Yet as we reflect on everything that has changed in the last year, it rings, it rings true. From science, we know that the coronavirus, it travels in the air. And therefore, wearing these face masks, even though it doesn't guarantee 100% protection, face masks do help mitigate transmission. And think about even the cold and flu season. We think about how uh, back in July, uh, June, July, and August, we were told that in Australia, the cold and flu season was crushed because all these people we're wearing face masks. And even for us, as we're uh, ending the winter and beginning spring, for us, I've even noticed because um, I haven't, I've had no colds, I've had no coughs during our, our, our cold and flu season, we've seen the results of, of, uh, of what's been happening. Everything has changed as we live in this new reality. There are similarities as we begin to think about how everything has changed when it comes to Easter. The Good Friday story and the Easter Sunday story has been told for thousands of years. Even for St. Giles, for our Good Friday service, we read from Matthew's Gospel of the Passion of the Christ, and we read about Jesus' betrayal into the hands of the authorities. We read about uh, Jesus being betrayed by one of his closest friends, Judas Iscariot. We remember that the Sanhedrin gave Jesus a sham trial. We recall that Peter, one of Jesus' most loyal, one of his most loyal followers, 
denies and disowns knowing the, the Christ. We look back and we are reminded of Pontius Pilate and how, uh, how the soldiers had mocked Jesus. And ultimately, we are taken back. Seemingly, we relive those moments of Jesus being crucified and as he dies and as he was buried. We're told that there were first-hand witnesses like Simon of Cyrene who was forced to carry the cross of Jesus. We were told about Joseph of Arimathea as Jesus laid there dead, bringing Jesus into his own brand new tomb so that Jesus could be laid to rest. All the evidence shows that Jesus dies this very human death. And even his followers, they expected that their teacher, their great rabbi, had been slain before their very eyes. We're told that there were many followers, many of whom were, were women, who had witnessed firsthand what had happened to Jesus. And we were told of Mary Magdalene, and the Mary of James and Joseph, the, the mother of Zebedee's sons, they were there as well. Matthew even records for us that Joseph of Arimathea takes Jesus' body, wraps it, and places it in the tomb according to the burial practices of the day. And that on Sunday, both Mary returned to the tomb in order so that they could redress Jesus' body. Everything points to having Jesus having died on the cross on, good, on that very Good Friday. And so we read this, yet we see something has changed. The Easter Sunday story begins very early in the morning. We're told that at dawn, the two Marys went to look at the tomb. And at the tomb, we're told that there was this earthquake. And it wasn't even just a tremor, but it was like this very violent earthquake. Something that was so terrifying that the guards shook in their boots and they were like, they appeared to be like dead men. Now remember what the purpose of the guards were. The purpose of the guards was being posted at Jesus at this uh, dead man's tomb was because the authorities were afraid that Jesus' followers, his disciples, would come and that they would steal away Jesus' body. The authorities feared that if the disciples had stolen the body, that they could claim that Jesus had actually raised from the dead. And so what if the disciples had come and stolen the body? What, what, would, what would happen if they made these claims? The religious authorities the, uh, feared that this would start a revolution and that Jesus' followers would be so emboldened that they would actually rise up against Rome. The guards being posted at Jesus' tomb was to prevent this revolution to happen. And so that very first Easter Sunday morning, we're told that such a violent earthquake occurred that these battle-hardened, these um, grizzled Roman soldiers, they were so terrified that they shook in fear, and they became like dead men. Now that, when we read it, is a powerful image. But what happens next? We're told that as the two Marys, as they enter the tomb, as they went to look for Jesus, they are greeted by an angel who confirms to them what just had happened. The angel of God said to them, the one that you are looking for, Jesus, he was crucified, but he is not here. He is risen just as he said that he would. Look at the evidence. Come and see where he laid. Come and see where Joseph of Arimathea had just placed Jesus just three days earlier. Now go. Go and tell the disciples. Go and tell Jesus' followers what you have seen. and Tell them that Jesus will meet them in Galilee. And so after hearing the good news, the, the Marys, they hurried off and they go and find the disciples. And as they go, as they're on their way, Jesus suddenly appears to them and sends them greetings. And when the Marys see him, they're so excited, they're so happy to see Jesus that they fall to their feet, that they clasp 
his ankles, and they worship him. This was no ghost of Jesus. It was no apparition. It was no spirit of Jesus. The women, the two Marys, they were so excited that they actually grabbed onto Jesus' feet. And so for Jesus, this was the bodily resurrection. It was Jesus alive again. And Jesus tells the Marys, do not be afraid and go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee where I will meet them. Let's pause here for a moment in Matthew 28, and let's really think about what's been happening. Matthew, the author, his purpose, his theme of the book was to make sure that everyone knew that Jesus was legit, that Jesus was indeed from the line of King David, that what Jesus had done on his earth, earthly ministry was powered by the Holy Spirit, and it was done through the work of God. And now at the peak, at the crescendo of the story, Jesus, uh, Jesus, is, uh, Jesus is, 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 comes and Matthew claims that Jesus has risen from the dead. Jesus had been resurrected after being dead for three days. This claim of being resurrected from the dead is something that ought to make every Christian examine and re-examine uh, their faith at some point. Do we, do we blindly accept the scriptures and what they tell us? Can we really ex accept what the Bible has, has laid out for us? The difference between resurrection and resuscitation is similar, but it's also very, very different. Ali and I had this discussion recently, and we, we came to the conclusion that both resurrection and resuscitation both can mean, can result in being brought, brought back from the dead. But the difference is this, is that in resuscitation, there's this very small window where you can be brought back. And I remember the day when my dad had, had a heart attack and he died, and I remember uh, the paramedics coming and giving him CPR. And I remember watching the scene and thinking to myself, okay, I'll give it 20 minutes. If they can bring dad back, if they can resuscitate him, then I think we're going to be in, in good shape. And five minutes went by, 10 minutes went by, 20 minutes went by. And as time kept on, ticking, uh, kept, kept, kept on going on, I thought to myself, at 45 minutes, I said to myself, please stop. Because even if you were able to bring dad back after 45 minutes of doing CPR, baseline, his quality of life, wouldn't be the same. And so for us, when we think of resuscitation, when we think of bringing back, coming back from the dead, this is one, uh, one example of that. The resurrection, though, is completely different. The resurrection tells us that Jesus had been dead, had been buried for three days. The resurrection should make us do a double take and really make us re-examine what is going on. If the resurrection didn't happen, then really we ought to just pack up our bags and close up the church. If the resurrection isn't real, then everything that we talk about in the church doesn't mean anything, because it just means that Jesus was a very good man who lived a long time ago, who taught really good things. However, if we pause... And we say, yes, you know what? The resurrection really, truly did happen. Then everything that we know in life, everything we know about this world has changed. If the bodily resurrection really happened, then my perspective of how I approach the world ought to change as well. In the resurrection, we know that Christ has conquered death. Even in a few short verses, we're told that Jesus proves to the two Marys that he has been bodily, uh, uh, he has come back in bodily form. We're told later in the scriptures when Jesus meets the disciples, he has brex breakfast with them uh, of fish on the beach. We're told that when Jesus meets the disciples, we're told that Thomas doesn't believe until he's able to touch Jesus' hands and his feet. 
when we read this, we know that in the very first Easter Sunday, everything for the disciples, as they realize that Jesus has been resurrected, everything for the disciples has changed. They saw that what Jesus had been telling them was real. And now they understood that no matter where they went into the world, no matter who they encountered, no matter what kind of trials and tribulations that they would face, nothing could put fear in their hearts. Death was the great equalizer for all of humanity. And in Jesus, Jesus had conquered death. The disciples now knew that Jesus would would forever be with them and nothing uh, could ever put fear in them ever again. For those first disciples, when they heard the good news, how did they respond? The two Marys told them to go to Galilee, and the Gospel of of Matthew gives this account uh, of the resurrection. We're told that the uh, disciples obeyed, and they went. And Thomas always gets this bad rap, right? I mean, we're told that he's called Doubting Thomas. We're told that he is the one... Uh, He was the first one that didn't believe that Jesus was truly alive. Yet, I can understand where he's coming from. Think about the two Marys and what they've just told you. They've said, look, we went to the tomb. We saw with our very own eyes that Jesus was alive. We saw him and we fell down and before him grabbed his feet and we worshipped him. He is alive. Some of the disciples, they believe him, but not for Thomas. He had, to, um, he had to see with his own eyes. He had to feel the scars on Jesus' body. He had to put his fingers through his hands and his feet. I get that. In fact, I understand that. Think about our own situation in 2021 with the global pandemic. We're told a year ago that there's this virus that is going around the world that has the potential to... Um, to, to destroy all of humanity. But then one day we're told that there is this vaccine. In fact, there are four uh, types of vaccine that have been developed. And if you take it, you'll get this high percentage of protection that you would have this new lease on life. And then you ask the question, would you take it? Friends, this is the entire dilemma. Or so this is the, this is the dilemma that the entire world faces Today, you have a choice of either to take the vaccine or not to take the vaccine. For Tauding Thomas, he needed to wait. For Thomas, he needed to see the results. For Thomas, he needed to know what the numbers say. He needed to see with his own eyes and, and to see whether or not the two Marys had been telling the truth. And for Thomas, when he did see with his own eyes, he then believed. And what does Jesus say to Thomas? He says in John chapter 20, verse 29, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and who believe. Thomas gets this bat rap because he first doubted Jesus. He, um, he was the one that didn't believe. But for Thomas, the remarkable thing is that after he saw Jesus, everything changed for him as well. History tells us that after the resurrection, Doubting Thomas ends up being a missionary all the way to India. In fact, we're told that Doubting Thomas loses his life, becomes a martyr for Jesus Christ in India. The thing about the resurrection is that for those who were eyewitnesses, those who saw what had happened, They were so convinced that Jesus had come back from the dead that they were willing to go to obey Jesus, to lose their lives. For the church, Easter Sunday poses this big challenge for us all. First of all, it is believing for ourselves truly whether or not the resurrection is real. Medically, the resurrection, it baffles the mind. It doesn't make any sense. How is it possible that a man was crucified, was executed, died, and then comes back to life three days later. And if this is possible, 
The big question is, what do we do with this information? I truly believe that each and every one has to wrestle with this, uh, with this issue. And then decide for ourselves whether or not we can accept this truth. Because if we accept this truth, then this will change the way we see the world. So, for example, if the world says, okay, money. Money is the end all and be all of things. Then naturally we'll go and we'll chase after money. If, for example, the world says power is the end all and be all of things. We see people dedicating their lives to obtaining power and then holding that power over people in order to control them. But for the church, if we say that Christ is the end all and be all of things, if God is the alpha and the omega, if he is the beginning and the end, then the natural conclusion is that we would want the world to come and know who Jesus Christ is. We would come, want to know that the kingdom of God is established here on this earth. As it says in the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Friends, as we uh, close, our, close out our time this morning, may you recall the triumphal entry. May you recall the passion of the Christ, his suffering, his betrayal, his crucifixion, and his resurrection. God has invited us all into this redemptive story for the world. May he bless St. Giles as we live out this good, news of, to, this good news of the gospel to the world, to his people. May everyone come to know that Jesus is alive. He is risen. And all of God's people said, Amen. Jesus commands my 
As we continue our worship this morning, we celebrate the sacrament of communion together. According to the Gospel of Luke, when the Lord was at the table with his disciples, he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them. And then their eyes were opened and they re recognized who he was. Therefore, that we may fulfill our Lord's intention for us, we take these natural elements of bread, as well as the cup and the juice, and we've set them apart for all common uses to this holy mystery as Christ gave thanks. We present to God our prayers as well as our thanksgiving. Let's pray. With a rush of wind and tongues of fire, you fulfilled the promise of Christ by sending your Holy Spirit to form the church. By the same Spirit, you, your grace, you give us grace with gifts, empower us to proclaim your gospel as we serve you in the world. Amen. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts, and we lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. You commanded the light to shine out of the darkness. You divided the sea and the dry land. And you created this vast universe. And you called it good. You made us in your image 
as we live in love with one another. You gave us the breath of life and the freedom to choose your way. You set forth your purpose in commandments through Moses as you called for justice through your prophets. Through long generations, you have been patient and you have been kind to all of your children. And so how wonderful are your ways, Almighty God. How, how marvelous is your name, O Holy One. You alone are God. Therefore, with the apostles and that, that great cloud of witnesses you, that, who live for you beyond t- all time and space, we lift up our hearts in joyful praise. Holy, holy Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And so we praise you. We praise you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, who lived among us, who was so full of grace and truth. He shared in our joy and our sorrows, and he healed the sick, and he was a friend to sinners. Obeying you, he took up his cross, and he died so that we all might live. We praise you that he overcame death and has risen to rule the world, and we know that he is still a friend to sinners. We trust him to overcome every power, that can hurt and divide us. And so we thank you, Lord God, for loving the world. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, Father, our God in heaven. Amen. On that faithful night, Jesus was with his disciples, and he took bread, And he broke it, and he shared it with his friends. And as he was having this meal, as he was sharing this meal with his disciples, he poured a cup and he filled it, and he gave it to his friends. And so those of you at home, if you are able, if you have prepared the elements, this is the body of Christ that has been broken for you. Take and eat and do this in remembrance of him. And friends, as you take this cup, we are reminded that this is the new covenant that was sealed in Jesus' blood. Whenever you do this, take and drink in remembrance of Jesus. And so friends, the body of Christ has been broken for you. The blood of Christ has been shed for you. And during this Easter Sunday, we are reminded that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead that he is alive, and he is indeed alive for all of us. Will you join me in prayer? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks once again for this communion table, that we get to share it with one another, even though virtually we are still joined together through Christ because of the sacrifice that you gave on the cross. Heavenly Father, wherever we are, my brothers and sisters in Christ, we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would continue to lead us and guide us, help us to be your arms and feet in this world, so that more and more people might come to know that Jesus Christ is Lord. We ask in your name. Amen. And friends, as we continue on with our worship, uh, we'll end with the prayers Uh, for the offering, as well as the, the prayer shawls. And after that, we'll have our benediction and our blessing. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you once again, and we thank you, Lord God, for the many gifts that you have given to us. We thank you, Lord God, for these first fruits of people who 
um, are just so faithful, who come and know that you are God, that want to see your kingdom expand in this world. We pray for healing of brokenness, reconciliation from, with one another, and that as we extend your love to the world, that more and more people are blessed by it. Heavenly Father, we have this ministry here at St. Giles of uh, prayer shawls, and we pray for those shawls that are being made and created, that as they go out, as they uh, comfort people who are grieving, loss, and mourning, that they would come to know and, and remember, Lord God, that it is your strong arms that keep us safe. It is your strong arms uh, that wrap, wrap, wrap around us, Lord God. Be with us as we go. We pray in your name. Amen. And so, friends, receive this as your benediction and blessing on this Easter Sunday. And as you go, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you from now until forever. Go in peace.